and welcome. In 1993, DC started Vertigo Comics, an imprint that had been specifically designed to create comic books that explored mature themes and had content that generally fit outside the typical superhero comics they had been publishing at that time. Vertigo would also be the imprint that would take over some of the existing DC titles such as Sandman, Hellblazer, and Swamp Thing, to name but a few. These were all comics that really didn't fit into a specific genre, although most were considered to be horror or fantasy. And they all did well, despite being oddities that looked out of place on a newsstand. The editor that oversaw all of these aforementioned existing titles was Karen Berger, and she deserves the bulk of the credit for not only the idea for the imprint, but for getting it established in the first place. For 20 years, Miss Berger maintained a level of consistency and quality throughout the entire line of comics. Without her, it's hard to predict whether Vertigo would have existed in the first place. Perhaps it would have in some other similar form. Certainly without her editorial guidance, it wouldn't have become a prestigious imprint that attracted creative talent throughout the 90s. Over the years, Vertigo would not only expand their line of titles, but they would also expand the type of content they would publish. Fantasy and horror did dominate, but the imprint also included modern noir, science fiction, and straight-up blasphemy. With these relaxed restrictions toward content, Vertigo was the place for a creator to explore themes they wouldn't be able to within an average superhero comic book. Furthermore, Vertigo also offered creators the rights to the material they created. However, that did mean the creators would take less money up front, but they had the opportunity to make more money in the long term should their comic book become popular. In other words, both parties, the creator and the publisher, would share the risk. But more importantly, they would also share the profit. However, despite owning their material, creators weren't allowed to take their property to another publishing company should their series be cancelled. And while there was a lot of creative freedom, it wasn't absolute. Vertigo Editorial did have an input in stories and the direction of the series they published. For most creators, that was a better deal than anything that was being offered by a major publisher. At the time, comic book talent made a page rate, and that was about it. If the comic book sold over a certain amount, sure, the talent would get a little kickback. But that didn't really compare to owning the rights to their creation and sharing profit for a title over time. Not to mention the creative freedom Vertigo allowed was rather attractive. Yeah, things are a bit different nowadays for mainstream talent, but that's a rather recent development, and I'll get back to that in a minute. One misconception about Vertigo Comics is that it was established so that DC could subvert the restrictions of the Comics Code. Simply put, uh, no. The Comics Code Authority was pretty ineffectual at regulating comics at this point in comics history anyway. But more to the point, the Comics Code only came into effect if the comics were going to be distributed to newsstands and traditional mainstream outlets. The distribution channels to those venues would only accept comic books if they had passed Comics Code standards. This standard didn't apply to the direct market. For those who don't know, direct market is a fancy way of saying comic book stores. Vertigo Comics were only ever intended to be distributed to the direct market, not to newsstands and such. The direct market distributors, primarily Diamond Comics distributors and Capital City Distribution, couldn't care less whether the comic was code approved or not. So bypassing comics code regulations wasn't even on the agenda when Vertigo Comics was established. Myth dispelled. Vertigo launched with a rather aggressive publishing strategy. Two new titles, either an ongoing or limited series, would be launched every month for the first year. And it thrived, putting out an average of roughly 15 titles per month. While not everything Vertigo published was a success, you could at least say the titles that didn't connect with an audience were an honest failure. Off the top of my head, I can't think of any titles that felt phoned in. They may have had other flaws, like a sketchy premise or an approach to a genre that was uninteresting. But I can't say that the best effort wasn't put forward by the creative teams on those titles. If I had to choose a criticism that generally applied to a lot of these failures, it would be one very specific thing. They were wordy and overwritten, like they were novels that were being illustrated, rather than comic books that integrate both words and pictures. You see this a lot when writers from other mediums attempt to write a comic book, but that's a topic for another time, perhaps. In recent years, Vertigo hasn't done very well at all. Not only has the comic book market become very focused on the next big superhero thing to the exclusion of everything else, but the incentives Vertigo offered to creators are not as attractive as they once were. Creators' rights were the best deal around from the publishers in 1993, but by the early 2000s, these rights looked no better than what you received from grinding out a superhero comic. 
In fact, one would do better writing a franchise superhero title for a brief period, as opposed to slaving over a tightly plotted 50-issue series from Vertigo. But the largest factor in Vertigo's downfall is the rise and evolution of another company that started at nearly the same time as Vertigo, Image Comics. Image is now the home for anyone looking to pursue a creator-owned title, emphasis on creator-owned. In fact, their publishing contract is the best in the industry. They publish and distribute the comics, take a cut of profits, and that's about it. I think they might have a stake in a property expanding into other media, like movies and TV, for example. But I'm not really sure about that. I could be wrong. The point being the creators fully own the material, and, if the creators so choose, as Brian Michael Bendis did at one point with Powers, they can take their comic book to another publisher. There are no obvious restrictions concerning content, and no editorial mandate. And, if you hit it big in the comic book lottery, as Brian K. Vaughan and Fiona Staples did with Sega, you reap the rewards. Yeah, Image shares in that success, but in a manner that is very fair to the creators involved. The mix of creative control, freedom, and rewards can't be matched by Vertigo as it currently exists. And within the corporate structure that Vertigo finds itself, it likely never will. Since 2002, Vertigo has only had two series that connected with an audience, Why the Last Man and Fables, both of which have since concluded. And they've not published a title in the last decade or so that has lasted more than 20 issues. Which isn't to suggest they've not had some great titles in the past few years. Clean Room by Gail Simone was an excellent example of Lovecraftian horror, but it only lasted 16 issues. Saucer Country by Paul Cornell was a great UFO conspiracy story that lasted only 14 issues before being cancelled. It has subsequently moved to IDW, and it has picked up from where it ended. This is the only example of a cancelled Vertigo series that went on to another publisher that I could find. These are two recent examples of series that really should have survived much longer than they did, but there doesn't seem to be a market for them. Personally, I don't know why that is. It may be that the Vertigo brand is currently unattractive to both consumers and creators, so these titles end up at other publishers, where they are given the time and support to establish themselves and possibly thrive. If we're being honest here, Vertigo is probably on its last legs. It will continue on for a while, but in a highly reduced capacity. I think it's more likely DC will dissolve that imprint within the next 5 to 10 years. Then they'll take over publishing its back catalog of successful evergreen titles like Sandman, Preacher, and Fables, and reintegrate other titles back into their usual line of comics, like they've already done with Hellblazer, Swamp Thing, and Animal Man. While comic book sales are relatively stable, this is a digital age, and that is having an effect that most publishers don't even know how to deal with yet. Hell, they can't even define the effect, let alone adapt to it. So the safe bet for publishers is to focus on superhero franchise content, rather than niche material that is both unproven and not exactly mainstream. Within that context, Vertigo is unlikely to survive. That's simply my speculation, based on the current conditions of comic book publishing. It is possible that Vertigo will continue on, but merely as an imprint that offers up collections of prior successes. Whatever happens to Vertigo in the future, it should be remembered as an imprint that had a perceptible influence on the comic book genre. Yes, there have always been alternative press publishers, such as Fantagraphics, for example. But Vertigo brought independent titles to the mainstream. It's not solely responsible for proving that mature titles can exist and thrive along superhero titles, but I would suggest it was the most successful. Without it, without the diversity of material it successfully published, other publishers might not have taken a chance on material with mature themes and a unique creative vision.